I almost lost my voice last night at that amazing cocktail reception. So hopefully <laughs> talking to everyone and all of you. So um, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking me to speak. Um, I've been in the trade show and events industry for what, what was the child prodigy age, um, <laughs> over 30 years um, uh, with the different organizations and now have the opportunity to do something completely different, as Monty Python would say. So a um, 140-year-old startup may seem kind of strange, so I'm going to explain this to you. Um, you know, so whether you're 40 or 140, when I thought about the 140-year-old startup, I thought of, of course, the 40-year-old version. <laughs> Everybody thinks about that, right? And you know, sometimes it's painful, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's days when you want to scream Kelly Clarkson, right? OK, for those of you who know the movie. Anyway. <laughs> So um, what I'm going to share here is really just our story to this point. It's an innovative, different business model. Um, and hopefully it spurs some ideas for you or, or helps you to think about some things a little bit differently. Um, so here's first the polling question. So everybody get your phones out and uh, get the QR code going and ask the question. This is a word cloud. So this is a different kind of thing. Um, what do you think of, what word comes to mind or words come to mind? No profanity, please. Um, when you think about an association or society launching a for-profit subsidiary. Necessary greedy. Okay, that's good. Yeah, good luck. Thank you. I guess I can see him here. Yeah. Crazy, I like that one. Cha-ching. <laughs> Painful, yes. Smart. That's awesome. I like this feature, don't you? It's kind of cool to see what everybody's thinking. Um, so these are all very interesting words. And let me tell you, there's a lot of these go through our minds on a daily basis. Um, there's a book out there, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And they talk about being in a startup and that there's two emotions that are prevalent most of the time. And one of them is sheer terror, and the other one is euphoria. And they're both accentuated by lack of sleep. So good news. <laughs> You're going to be on a roller coaster. So to tell you a little bit about the story, um, ASME is the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Been around for 140 years. Standards Development Organization uh, was founded back at that time, because boilers were exploding, people were dying, it was a very bad thing. And so there were standards related to boilers, which some of you may have them in your homes. You may have them in your school, in a hospital. Um, and so this was founded for that purpose. But now, really, the organization has evolved with the mission of advancing engineering for the benefit of humanity. There are a lot of programs related to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There's a lot of real good that ASME does in the world. Um, but like a standards organization, sometimes there are things that can appear to be a conflict of interest. When you're setting the standard for, and there's over 500 standards at ASME, here's just a glance at the organization and the size and the scope of what they do, um, probably like a lot of societies or associations you're familiar with. And there are things that when you are setting the standard, which is actually the motto, setting the standard, um, for certain areas, things that are related to sales and marketing and connecting buyers and sellers can appear to be a bit of a conflict of interest. And so, um, Metrics was created, and uh, here's just a little video about us. ASME has always brought industry together. Now, it's time to transform it. Introducing Metrics, an ASME company. A host of ideas award-winning content, thought leadership, communities and innovation, a host of experience online and offline, an events and content platform for collaboration in the new world, trusted brands, a host of insights in additive manufacturing, digital engineering, energy transformation, Robotics. The innovation curve has just begun. Metrics welcomes the industry with a host of ideas. Visit our website today. Visit metrics-connect.com for more information. 
And it always sounds better with a British accent, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> to all of you Brits out there, all right? Um, so really, Metrics was created to unleash this area. I joined ASME in 2018 to set up an area on industry events, doing industry events. Our first industry event was scheduled for May 27th of 2020 in Minneapolis, which as many of you know is George Floyd Day, as well as being in a pandemic. So we were faced with the opportunity, let's say, to change our business, do some different things, and we did that. And as we progressed and we did a lot of virtual events and different things, we saw the potential to really have a completely different kind of business with events as part of it and other pieces as well that I'll go into in a minute. But um, our first speaker, Aaron, talked about you know, communities where you belong. And to us, that's really the heart of what we're creating. Um, is the community where people are going to come for their information, for the latest views on the future of engineering, on a lot of different topics, but specifically centered around digital transformation of industry. So these are the brands that we are currently um, representing. These are our brands, um, thanks to MDG for some of those logos on that page. Um, <laughs> but uh, we are also the exclusive agent for the mechanical engineering media portfolio. Um, which is a well-known magazine. It's still a print magazine that goes to the homes of the members of ASME, which is pretty amazing nowadays. Um, but it's a whole diverse portfolio of podcasts and webinars and events and communities and websites, and that's really what we're working on, but centered on digital transformation of industry. So just to talk a little bit about our 2021 year in review, um, we at one point had a team of about 10 people doing all this. We're up to about 20 now. But um, we did webinars, we did 12 virtual events, we did actually, I believe, 16 virtual events over the entire pandemic. And we tried some different kinds of products. That was the great thing about the digital format, and I know we're trade show people, so we wanna go back to in-person, and I get it. But there was so many opportunities to just iterate products over and over, quickly, 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 try things. Maybe they worked, maybe they didn't work. But we did a lot of that in the, um, during the pandemic, and we're still doing it today. Um, we issued new newsletters. We launched a website. We actually purchased a website and revamped it. And in the first month it was there, it had 60,000 unique visitors. So we were really, you know, we're on pace, right? We're just working, working, working as fast as we can. Now we have 20 people, you know why. So some of the things that we did in this time frame was the 16 virtual events for 18,000 people from May of 2020 to December of 2021. And we did every format you could think of, live, simulive, recorded, on demand. Um, I don't know what you all have seen in terms of on-demand. I think it's just a nice to have. I don't know how many people are really going back to a live events for on-demand. But um, our first event that we did was in May of 2021, on that date that we were going to have the event in Minneapolis. And uh, we decided, you know what, we're just gonna do it. We're gonna go for it. We didn't have a lot of experience in virtual events, but we did it anyway. And um, some of our sponsors said, you were so brave to do that. <laughs> I took it as a compliment. It meant that some things didn't go well, but we were out there kind of doing things and, and learning as we went. Um, we did get an award for best use of networking technology, although I know that the networking piece of the virtual is a lot harder, it takes a lot more work. Um, very satisfied customers, and doing some different kinds of formats, like trying to put content in different formats. InnoZones are our sponsored content pieces, and they really have to be not product-centric. They're supposed to be a case study about an application. Uh, demo jams are product centric. It's a 10 minute product demo. Talk about your products. What, what do you have that's new and interesting? Think tanks were actually focus groups for customers uh, that some of our sponsors where they were working on new products or they wanted a little more insight into a particular market niche. Um, a table talk, which was more of a discussionary round table on a particular topic. Um, lunch and learns, of course, self-explanatory, but we did actually send people some Uber Eats gift cards as part of being in those lunch and learns, so that was kind of fun. One-in-one um, -one curated meetings was something that we tried in the virtual format, and it actually worked relatively well. It was very labor intensive. I've talked to a few of you here that do this for a living, so I'm, I'm learning more about it. But we had a lot of customers that wrote business from those one-on-one -on -one meetings, so that was a really great additional feature there. And now with the evolution of some of the virtual platforms, AI is powering the connectivity, so people are, solutions are finding the people, and, and people are finding the technologies that they want to see. And one of the key tenets of the organization when we founded it was we wanted an area dedicated to customer success, because virtual was hard, right? 
<laughs> Folks have been up here saying like, okay, so we're doing virtual events now, that's great. We really helped our uh, customers understand what that was about, to use the data, to, um, we built some of their virtual booths for them. We, we did a lot of that work for them just to make sure that they were successful. So here's another polling question. How much are you changing your events model from pre-pandemic? Couple options here. Um, not much at all, pretty much we're going back to business um, or creating a few new features. Um, oh, it's moving significantly, significantly, cool. Or you wouldn't even recognize it. What show is this? I don't even know. So some change, right? Because we can't just keep going back to what we did before. It's easier, muscle memory, right? You know, it's how you learn to play sports. It's how you learn yoga, thank goodness, right? Like muscle memory, but it's harder to not go back to what we've done before. I was at an industry trade show just a few weeks ago, and uh, it was a very vibrant community of active people that um, they see each other outside of the events, like they know each other, it's a very tight network. But what did we do? We put them in a room with a stage and talked at them for three hours. These, we have a lot of networking in this event, so kudos to you, Sam. But they, they were desperate to get back together, but yet it was just the one-way flow of information. So there's so many things that we can be doing that are different, and thanks, thanks for your feedback here. So, you know, a lot of people have said this, and I had to adjust this slide. It used to say more in the last 18 months than the last 18 years, but now it's getting longer. I feel like we're still kind of in this endemic piece of the pandemic. Um, Ken's piece, the blog he wrote, talked about 70 million people changing their emails. I think someone else mentioned that today as well. Um, that's crazy. Like, it's very hard to get a hold of people now to market to them. Um, and technology has filled the gap for a lot of the ways that people learn. People are like, you know what, I'm okay with being here in my pajamas in my living room. Not everyone is, but a lot of people are. And uh, there was an article in the Detroit Free Press, I'm from Detroit, if you haven't figured that out from my accent yet, um, <laughs> that uh, the Detroit Economic Club used to have a lot of these great luncheons. And so they would be at Ford Field or they'd be at a different you know, facility, a different hotel in Detroit. And they'd have luncheon programs, and they might have the CEO of Delta Airlines, or they'd have maybe sports personalities, and they got people there all the time, no problem. Well, what's happened is they went from about 60,000 people in downtown Detroit every day to about 20,000 people in downtown Detroit every day. And the people that are at home have a calendar full of Zoom meetings, like I'm sure a lot of you do, standing Zoom meetings that invaded our schedule <laughs> during the pandemic as well. And so, they're like, wait, we can't get people to come to these anymore because there's been a permanent shift in people's behavior and how they're operating. And so what they're doing and where they're finding some success is some after work programs. Um, they have the CEO of Anheuser-Busch coming and they're doing a beer tasting, which sounds great. <laughs> I will leave my house for that. So, um, you know, there's just a lot of innovative things that we, we need to do. And I think in person has been seen as a nice to have um, McKinsey, I believe, had a travel budget of $350 million that they're cutting in half. So, I mean, yes, we're on crowded airplanes, but that's another dynamic. So, companies are reducing their travel expenses, and how we work has changed. So, how do we respond to that with our events and trade shows? Do we just really go back to what we did before because it's easy and everybody knows what it is? I, I, don't, I don't think we can. So for us, what we're really trying to do is um, center on that human element. Like who is the attendee? Who's the part? And we we're still calling them attendees. I read something recently that said we should start calling them participants. Are we still calling them attendees? Um, we're still calling it a keynote. We're still calling it a panel. We're still calling it all these old terms. Like where can we innovate and do some different kinds of things? Um, a lot of the companies have changed their names. They're global experience specialists, right, Chuck? <laughs> it's experiences, right? We're, we're moving the cheese there. And um, as we look at design, what comes first? Where do we start with? Do we start with, here's our box that we need to fill? Or do we start with, here's the needs of our audience? Um, how many of you have done persona development on your shows? Yeah, you learn a lot, right, every single time. Um, and you really try to find out what motivates folks to actually come and attend in person. And, and new business models, I, I really think, um, even based on what Jeannie was saying earlier, that um, they're changing their spend. Exhibitors are changing the money that they spend with us. 
the revenue model of the sponsorship and the exhibit space and all of that being consistent is, is starting to shift a little bit, right? So the question is, how do we innovate to really kind of keep creating these new experiences? So one of the things that we're doing, and I am in this coveted um, post-lunch spot, so I hope you all had a lot of pasta and bread, and you're super awake right now. Um, but something called the network effect, has anybody heard of that? How many of you have an iPhone? Let's just start there. You have an iPhone? Yeah, okay. iMessage, right? Um, sharing things, AirDrop, whatever it is you want to have. That's a network effect because everyone who has an iPhone makes it that much value, more valuable for you to have an iPhone. And so the greater number of buyers and sellers and users, the greater the value of the whole thing. So look at something like Lyft. If it was one car, it wouldn't work very well. Etsy, which I love Etsy. Who loves Etsy? I love Etsy. Great for gifts. Just if you ever need weird, strange gifts for your friends, go to Etsy. Um, StubHub, same idea. All the tickets, the ticket marketplace. And so part of what we are really doing, it's like people will ask us, they'll say, well, what is your company? What do you do? It's like you want to say, well, we're an events and media company. But we're really a marketplace company. We're really creating marketplaces for people to come together, whether it's in person, online, some other way in the future, um, and building communities of knowledgeable people that then make it infinitely more valuable for those other people seeking solutions to come to. And um, the idea of this is that by creating a community, people are connecting with each other, and that's great. But they're also connecting with you in a more 24-7, 365 way, which I know we've said that. Everybody's going to a 365 strategy. But we really have to. Um, you can't email people anymore. <laughs> we already talked about the evils of GDPR, right? Um, it's, it's an art. So you know, in leveraging the technology that's out there on the different platforms and, and content, I mean, how hard is it to build all this content? It's a lot. I was talking to some folks about it today. But content is king. People want content. That's what drives them there. That's what makes the meaningful connection with your sponsors and exhibitors, right? So generating all that content, it's expensive, but it needs to be done. And so solutions are needed there as well. And a platform gives you the ability to share that content with other people. Um, the idea of opt-in communication, which I just mentioned, and then crowdsourcing and feedback. I have to tell you, my dream is to do a conference where like, every topic is crowdsourced. Like, from a logistical standpoint, it would be a nightmare. And trust me, my two staff in this room are like, get her off the stage. <laughs> but think about how cool that would be. Like, the whole thing just populates from what people are really interested in. Um, it'd be super cool. So for us, we're evolving the portfolio. Um, events are still part of it. They're part of it, for sure. It's part of the core of what we do. Sponsored content, websites, a 365 community, um, webinars and podcasts. We're even doing a live show that we stream on every other Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern called AM News Live. It is uh, streaming on, I believe, Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube and a couple other things. Live, of, live show production online is kind of crazy. Like, we think show production is live. But you remember, like, I remember when we first went into the virtual space and I was like, well, yeah, but what if the internet goes out? It's not like if my microphone goes out, you give me a megaphone or you know, we start doing sign language or whatever. It's like, you're done. So some of that is a little nerve wracking, but it's been super cool. And people have really responded to the live show aspect of it. Um, and then the idea of more video, we're still doing e-newsletters to build the database. Um, some interactive media like um, infographics and surveys and quizzes. Um, custom research is another thing that we're doing as well as industry reports which are really powered by our network of volunteers and uh, folks that are industry um, subject matter experts and can come to us and really help us to disseminate some of the industry um, data that people want to know. Uh, white papers is another thing. Lead gen. People are loving lead gen right now. One of the things that I feel like we learned over the pandemic is that the virtual event buy is a lot more like a media buy. It's really not a trade show buy. And um, to Jeannie's point earlier, it's a different person sometimes. It's a different competency of the people that are buying this from you. Um, so lead gen is very hot, I will tell you that for sure. And then custom engagement and then even some custom events we've been asked to produce for some of our customers. So I am not here to tell you that this is a smashing success nine months in. Uh, Metrics was launched officially in September of 2021. 
Um, it is a work in progress, but um, we were talking about Brene Brown earlier, so I'll say Brene Brown interviews Viola Davis on a podcast. You gotta hear it, it's really good. And um, one of the things that Viola Davis says is on this slide, which is teachers don't know all the answers, but they're just brave enough to speak their truth. And so I hope that by sharing a little bit of our journey and where we've been and kind of what we're looking at in the future, like I really hope to be like where Wayne Gretzky always says, you have to go to where the puck's gonna be. Like you can't, right? You guys, Wayne Gretzky, 99, thank you. Number 99, okay, anyway. Um, you have to go to where the puck's gonna be and so we're planning for the points converging in a couple years down the road that hopefully we'll be in the right space with our um, products and the marketplace that we're building um, in the technologies that we're in. So um, that's all I had. Thank you very much. I want to say that it wasn't a food stupor. People were uh, hanging on every, every one of your words because it was very, very interesting. And it, it is a tough slot. So thank you. Thank you for taking it. Uh, any questions? Oh, yes. So we work with a lot of engineering organizations where it seems like the companies are all aging out. The engineers are, but then on the other side you see engineering schools, like, like is the future bright for engineering organizations to restaff, restock, get people thrilled about events again? Like, like, what's the pendulum going to be? Yeah, so, you know, the average age, I think, of uh, engineering or manufacturing industrial audience, let's say we'll take a broad swath, is about 55 years old, 56 years old. And it's, it's pale and male, <laughs> so um, that's also true. But um, we, we actually have a motto in our company, thank you, Veronica, which is no more mantles. Um, we're really, we have diversity goals actually attached to a lot of our events and what we want to represent. Because we feel that representation matters. And I think that's going to matter a lot more in the future as well for future engineers and current early career engineers to see themselves in some of these leadership positions. Um, engineering is changing because of technology. Um, even mechanical engineering is becoming a lot more interdisciplinary where you have to know coding and you have to understand automation and you can't just necessarily be a mechanical person. But a lot of these technologies that we're focused on in digital transformation are, are driving some of that new view of what's possible in an industrial world. And so I'm optimistic that we are gonna be filling that. I, we don't have enough people in, you know, you guys see STEM in your local you know, high schools or elementary schools, science, technology, engineering, and math, and there's even arts in there, sometimes it's STEAM. But um, we have to be supporting these programs or we're, we're gonna run out of the, the talent that we need in this country to defend ourselves and drive commerce, so. I have a couple of questions, or at least one from Slido. Are you able to sell your services to sister associations? Yeah, so that's a great question. I kind of skipped that part. So because we are um, independent of ASME, although we are a wholly owned subsidiary C Corp, we're a for-profit entity. Um, we are able to work with whomever we wish. So it really freed us up to work with media companies, other organizations, potentially competitive groups, if, if there is that particular moniker on it. And it, it really does give us the opportunity to, um, to drive partnerships. We have several very active partnerships right now. Um, one with AMT, of course, who's here in the audience. We have some others, one with Informa. We're working with them as well on some projects um, and some others in the works too, so. Any other question? There's a question in the back right there. Could you talk a little bit more about the decision to have a for-profit versus a non-profit? And uh, one of your, the first questions was, uh, many people said complicated or difficult. And now that you have some time behind you, do you, what's the value of having the not the for-profit as an entity uh, of the for-profit? And is there a branding issue associated with this metrics, which is powered by this nonprofit, even though you wanted to have distance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And um, it's one that we get asked a lot, even by the constituency of ASME, like why a for-profit? 
But part of the reason that we were spun out was to provide us with some latitude to do the things that we thought we needed to do to grow the business. And one of those is not necessarily being beholden to the regulations that are necessary to be a nonprofit. Um, all of our profits, when they come, will be going either back into the business to invest or back to ASME, the parent organization. So it will still be funding the mission of the organization. So that's partly how, how we explain it. But um, it's really about not having the compliance issues, you know, the handcuffs on you that go with a nonprofit, um, the legal implications of that. Um, we're just able to kind of do, do what we wish. And um, ASME actually has purchased a couple other organizations that are for profits. They own Tech Street, which is a um, standards reseller. Some of you may be familiar with that. And they just spun out another for profit about two weeks ago um, related to. Um, digital twin assessment type work, so um, it does happen. I will tell you though that um, unwinding out of a large organization like that, there's, what did it say, I think there's over 400 employees now, I think that slide was actually a little older. Um, unwinding out of that with the administration and the systems and the business systems has been a little bit of, of work there. Um, it would have been advantageous to us to have started that a little bit sooner, but um, everything's kind of up and running now. Um, in that way. So does that answer your question? Pretty much? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I have, I have one. Oh, okay. You went from, uh, you said you went from 10 staff to 20 staff. Um, you've been, as you said, you started when you were 16 in the, in the business. <laughs> right. What, uh, when you went from, uh, from 11 to 20, what were the titles, what were the types of skill sets that you hired that you, you needed? Sales, <laughs> right? Got to generate revenue. Um, we also hired a um, director of event technology and customer experience. So much of this is on a tech stack of products, and many of you are probably, some of them are in the lobby here. <laughs> you may be familiar with some of those. Getting the technology stack right, I have to tell you, is just a constant just emphasis for us. Um, things like just you know search engines and how they find you and websites and how ads are being served and we've actually employed a couple best-in-class solutions on our website additivemanufacturing.com we actually use the same uh, web and ad server that's on Wall Street Journal and New York Times and we just decided to kind of go big on that but we also hired folks for you know more in the customer success area to really help take care of those folks and um, content is our next one, where we're going to be building out more content roles. Um, some of that you're able to do with contractors, but someone still needs to be able to herd those kittens. So um, we have some folks now in, in content that are really active. Um, event management, product development, um, and operations, of course. So. All right. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks.